I may dislike Orban's economic policies, but boy, he's doing a tremendous job in countering the cultural left. In other news, the legal war on feminists continues and makes more and more of them tiptoeing around and in fear for their next move. And that is awesome! Also, anti-white racists have a new enemy who also likes to go to court. Double awesome! And lo and behold, the Swedish political class started to talk like me all of a sudden. It could be because of the upcoming elections, but it's still progress. Speaking of progress, there is nobody in the world right now that is more progressive than the Iraqi court system, which is going to great lengths to ensure uh, that it gets to close the gender sentencing gap. These are our stories on the Good News video. Hello everyone and welcome to the second episode of the Good News video. Alright, so since uh, the la last edition of the Good News video was uh, received fairly well, I thought I'd give it a try again. Maybe we'll make this one a permanent fixture like the Periodic Insanity series. We'll see how it goes. So, the first good news comes uh, via The Independent titled Iraq sentences German woman to death for joining ISIS, reports say. And goes like this, quote, An Iraqi court has sentenced a German woman to death after, the, after she ran away to join ISIS. The court in Baghdad convicted the unnamed German woman of uh, providing logistical support and assistance to the terrorist group to commit crimes and has ordered her execution. The spokesman of the Supreme Judicial Council, Abdul Sattar Barkdar, uh, said the woman acknowledged joining ISIS after traveling from Germany to Syria and then to Iraq along with her two daughters. Both daughters later married militants. She is believed to have been living in the Mannheim uh, region of Germany when she traveled to Syria but is reportedly of Moroccan descent. The woman is believed to have been among a number of women in July 2017 who were captured after the Battle of Mosul when Iraqi forces pushed ISIS out of Iraq's second city. She now faces hanging but can still appear her sentence, Mr. Uh, Bayekdar said. Iraqi forces have detained a number of foreign women after they drove ISIS from its former territory in northern and central Iraq. It is estimated that over 27,000 foreign fighters, including 6,000 Europeans, have traveled to Iraq and Syria since the start of the Arab Spring in 2011, but not all of them have joined ISIS, according to data published by the Sofran Group. Now, isn't this lovely? Almost every country in the world is rife with the terrible gender inequality known in academic circles as the gender sentencing gap, in which women get disproportionately lower punishments than men for the exact same crime. And the trend holds even when controlling for other factors such as socioeconomic status, ethnicity, or prior criminal history or record. Not Iraq, though. This is tremendous progress. Now, I'm sure the feminists are thrilled to hear about this news. Finally, some equality for women, and in the Middle East, no less. <laughs> Mind you, this is not the same case as with the other German woman, who is uh, also fa facing trial for treason, Linda Wenzel, whose trial is still ongoing. Now, I hope that trial also ends uh, with an execution, because in that case, just like in this case, there is no doubt about her being a traitor and being an Islamist and in war, especially in a war against Islamists and traitors, fraternizing with the enemy is still a capital offense in most of the world. Sure, it isn't in Europe. Here we elect traitors to lead our countries, or at least they do that quite frequently in Germany, the native land of these two traitorous women. But by and large, or the vast majority of the planet, the world still functions as it used to function when I was a little boy. And that is good, because that world was and is much fairer when it comes to these things. Let them all hang! Now, speaking of uh, 
fraternizing with the enemy and traitorous scum, Hungary is cooking up a new policy to deal with such elements. Via ABC News, Hungary seeks to punish those who aid illegal immigration. It goes like this, quote, a new set of laws would tax and possibly sanction Hungarian groups assisting illegal immigration which receive foreign funding, Hungary's government said on Wednesday. Such groups would have to register with the courts and, if they get more than half of their funds from foreign sources, pay a 25% tax on the funds received from abroad, Interior Minister Sándor Pinter said. Groups failing to register and which authorities consider uh, to be aiding uh, Ill illegal immigrants could be fined. Pinter, without mentioning anyone by name, gave an example of someone providing a smartphone containing maps and other information showing the way to Europe to a migrant in Belgrade, the capital of Serbia, and part of the Balkan road migrants use to try to reach Germany and other destinations in Western Europe. Also, restraining orders could be issued against Hungarian citizens considered to be uh, or organizing illegal migration, preventing them from going with, uh, within 8 kilometers or 5 miles of Hungary's Schengen borders, those with countries outside the European Union, such as Serbia and Ukraine. Foreigners found to be aiding illegal migrants could be banned from Hungary, Pinter said. Government spokesman Zoltan Kovac said the expectations were that Hungarian non-governmental groups which deal with illegal migrants on the issue of migration will follow the law and indicate to authorities that they are doing this activity. The government has dubbed the bills the Stop Soros Laws as it blames the Hungarian-American billionaire and philanthropist Soros Georgiou for Europe's migration challenges, partly because of his funding of groups that advocates for the rights of refugees. Pinter said, however, that, quote, I don't believe so far uh, George Soros has told anyone that he takes part in organizing illegal migration. Since the government expects uh, groups or people to declare voluntarily if they aid illegal migration, we are very curious to see whether Soros will or will not acknowledge doing so, Kovac added. The Hungarian Helsinki Committee, a rights group which provides legal aid to asylum seekers and receives parts of its funding from Soros' Open Society Foundations, drew attention to the government's proposed 8km restraining order and compared it to a 1969 decree by Hungary's then-communist government prohibiting citizens from going nearer than 2 kilometers from the borders. Close quote. Probably the Hungarian uh, Helsinki Committee should be the first one to be put in a helicopter. I say probably because I don't know all the details, but if they're just as crap as the Romanian Helsinki Committee, and I have no reason to suspect they aren't, then a free helicopter ride is probably in order. For those who may not be aware, these Helsinki Committee groups are basically the criminals' rights groups. They will tell you with a straight face that a pedophile, a traitor, a terrorist or a serial killer is a victim of human rights violation because they don't get an up-to-date TV set in their prison cells. And I wish I were joking. This is not a random example. A deputy director of the Romanian Helsinki Committee told me just that in a press briefing several years ago in reference to the international terrorist Constantinos Pasais currently serving a life sentence for armed robbery, first-degree murder and other uh, crimes at a maximum security facility about 45 kilometers from where I am videotaping this. Also, to compare these laws with the Soviet-era regulations is patently absurd, but the kind of absurdity only open borders leftists can concoct. The regulations they're mentioning would apply to almost any Hungarian citizen, whereas these ones are subjected to a due process and applied only to those proven to have been engaged in something that should be described more often as national treason, because that's exactly what it is. So good on the Orban administration for showing some intent on cracking down on these people. Now, mind you, I believe these laws don't go anywhere near far enough, but it is a great step in the right direction and it's certainly more than anyone else in Europe is doing on this subject. Now I know, I know, I know, more civil rights and shit, sure, but it is not a civil right to help move entire populations into or through Hungary or any other country for that matter when those populations have no legal reason to be there to begin with. 
And considering the level of crime and savagery that Hungary and Budapest in particular did experience in 2015 for the few days those people were in Hungary, it is quite fair to legislate against that kind of lunacy. What I saw in late 2015 in Budapest was essentially an invasion, to aid in the bet that should carry serious jail terms. Though sometimes I think the Iraqi gender, gender egalitarian way is much better. But only sometimes I think that, not always. <laughs> Speaking of populations that have no reason to be there, it seems that the Swedish political class has finally started to see things in a matter that resembles more of what you're hearing on this channel than what is normally the trend in the Red-Green Alliance. Coming via Reuters, Swedish Prime Minister does not rule out use of army to end gang violence. Sweden will do whatever it takes, including sending in the army to end the wave of gang violence that has seen a string of deadly shootings, Prime Minister Stefan Löfven said in Wednesday. Sweden's murder rate is relatively low in international terms, but gang violence has surged in recent years and Swedes are worried that the police are unable to cope. In 2016, the latest year for which uh, official statistics are available, 106 people were murdered in Sweden, a country of 10 million. But Swedish TV reported there were over 300 shootings, mostly in turf battles between gangs over drugs, protection rackets and prostitution. Four people were shot dead in the first week of, the, of this year. One man died after picking up a hand grenade outside a subway station in a suburb of Stockholm. Law and order is likely to be a major issue in a parliamentary election scheduled for September, with the populist opposition Sverige Demokraterna linking public concern about the rising crime rate to a large increase in the number of immigrants. Quote, it would not be the fir my first option to bring in the military, but I am prepared to do whatever is necessary to make sure that serious organized crime is stamped out, Löfven told news agency TT. The government has promised police an extra 7.1 billion kroner, or about $880 million, through 2020, toughened laws on gun crimes and made it easier for the police to monitor private phone calls and emails, among other measures. But a report by the Swedish National Council for Crime Prevention shows increasing number of Swedes worried about crime with confidence falling in the police and the judicial system. People are shot to death in pizza restaurants. People are killed by hand grenades they find on the street, Sweden Democrat Yemi Åkesson said in the parliament on Wednesday. This is the new Sweden, the new exciting, dynamic, multicultural paradise that so many here in this chamber have fought to create for so many years, he said sarcastically. <laughs> now, this article does make it sound like it's just another argument between Yimi Okison and Leuven, but it's a lot more than that. What Reuters doesn't say is that all political parties, except the Looney Asylum, that will be the leftist party and the Green Party, have effectively agreed with the Sweden Democrats. The Swedish paper Expressen offers a much more detailed review of what the political class is thinking. So let me read you some excerpts from there. Where the hell is the article? Oh, there we go. Quote. We see criminals showing a total lack of respect for human life, a development I am determined to change, also said Stefan Leuven. He continued, we will continue to fight the parallel communities steadfastly and sustainably. We will ensure that our tax money goes to what they are intended for and never ever for criminal activity. After that, it was uh, the, the, the turn of uh, Moderater, now leader, Ulf Christensen, uh, and he also delivered the speech. Christensen chose to focus on the same subject and went to, hard at the, to hardly attack on the government and accused the government also of not doing enough. Uh, quote, criminals have hand grenades that are, uh, and that are, the, in, in, are at war with our country, says Christensen from the uh, podium. He highlighted the problem of the increased number of shootings. This is not a script for a dystopian crime story. This is Sweden in 2018, says Christensen. Uh, Moderata now also wants to uh, install new language requirements. Last autumn, the leader of the Moderate Party said that he wants a cross-border agreement on immigration policy. During today's debate, Christensen said that the offer remains, but it will be harder to agree on the integration part. The moderate party wants to tighten up the demands of new arrivals and impose requirements for them to learn Swedish. 
In Sweden, they should speak Swedish. If they like to know more languages, that's fine, but they must speak Swedish. Later in the debate, he also highlighted the importance of new arrivals to learn the, the Swedish language. Quote, the Swedish language is difficult, but not impossible, just like good politics, Christensen said. The spokeswoman for the Green Party, that would be the Milieu Partiet, holy shit, Isabella Levin, even she highlighted the problems of crime in society, but chose to focus on rural issues as well. I see the problems, but I'm worried that we politicians weep up the fear, so that's the one who controls, said uh, Levin, pointing to opportunities she sees in the world today. As I said, the loony asylum. The Liberals and the Center Party also raised the, the issue of crimes and punishments in their speeches. In Stefan Löfven's Sweden, integration is failing, says Annie Löf, continuing. Security fails in our suburbs. People are pushed down or killed by hand grenades. Jan Björklund chose to address the importance of a good school and then proceeded to talk about the insecurity of the Swedish society. Girls in the suburbs are harassed by Muslim morality police, he said, continuing, quote, the rule of law is a liberal creation, he says, meaning that it is the weakest in society affected if the rule of law does not work properly, and it goes on and on just like that. Now remember, when I started this channel and made the first videos about Sweden, literally all of these things were completely taboo to utter in the public space. To even suggest that such thing as Islamic no-go zones exist in the first place was treated with contempt and derision as if you had just said that the earth is flat or that jet fuel can't melt steel beams. <laughs> Even in the comment sections of my older videos, I got butthurt Swedes telling me that I don't know anything about Sweden. Most of those have since stopped talking after I have uploaded my video series from the 2017 Sweden tour. So this is a huge development to have essentially the entire establishment sounding exactly like the counterculture used to sound just two or three years ago, or indeed even eight months ago before Leuven shut down the border. This is, for all intents and purposes, great news. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that our side of the argument won and we can all just go home now, but it does mean that the corridor of opinion is not just mostly, but effectively finished. Here comes the next frontier, getting more and more moderate and peeps to support the anti-immigrationist agenda. All of moderate and should be like Hanif Bali. In fact, Hanif Bali should be the most moderate voice. Everyone else in there should be even harsher than he is. Basically, the middle needs to be moved even further. The complete open borders positions need to be made not just politically unpalatable, but outside of the acceptable speech in public amongst civilized men. Yes, I want the far left to be ashamed to open their mouths in public, because no sane country allows such loons to gain influence. Anyway, uh, definitely good news and fantastic development. Now, of course, those of you who have been following this channel for years aren't particularly surprised, because this was predicted on this channel several times, but it's still, nonetheless, very good news. All right, let's go further with two stories that simply fill me with joy. <laughs> I'd like to see two or three stories like these uh, every week, quite frankly. First one, coming from Variety, Elisa Schlesinger sued for banning men from comedy show. An attorney who files discrimination suits against bars that offers ladies' nights has sued comedian Elisa Schlesinger, contending that her Girls' Night In show violated California law by barring men. According to the suit, George St. George bought a $30 ticket to Schlesinger's November 13 show at the Largo at the Coronet in Los Angeles, which was advertised as a No Boys Allowed. St. George and a male friend attempted to enter the show anyway. Initially, they were told they could sit in the back row, but later they were denied entry and offered a refund, the suit contends. St. George has been the plaintiff in several such suits, challenging ladies' nights at bars and other public establishments. His attorney, Alfred Rava, has also made a reputation for filing such suits, once telling CNN that he had filed 150 complaints accusing California businesses of violating the UNRU Civil Rights Act of 1959. 
At no time should an entertainer or an entertainment venue require female patrons or male patrons sit in the back of the theater based solely on their sex, Rava said via email. The California Supreme Court ruled in a Coy vs. Metro Car Wash 1985 that ladies' nights discounts violate the UNRU Act, which provides for full and equal accommodations to all business establishments regardless of race, sex, religion, and disability. Violators are punishable by a $4,000 fine plus attorney's fees. Businesses that are sued under the Act typically reach an out-of-court settlement rather than face the expense of litigation. Rava is a former secretary of the National Coalition for Men, a San Diego-based non-profit whose website highlights false rape accusations, fathers' rights issues, violence against men, and the myth that men do not do their fair share of housework. The site has also taken issue with the current sexual abuse hysteria. Rava said via email that he is no longer part of the group and that St. George was never a member. Schlesinger's representatives did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Now, an update. Uh, Schlesinger released the following statement. Since this is a legal matter, I'm uh, unable to comment to the specifics of this lawsuit. I will say that uh, of the many shows I do throughout the year, Girls Night In was a singular evening that encouraged women to get together, talk and laugh about things we go through, as well as donate some money to Planned Parenthood. It is unfortunate that is, this, is now, uh, this has now become an issue. Close quote. Good! <laughs> Very good. No, seriously, this lawsuit made my day when I first read the article, especially after reading the update by the feminist being sued. Oh, you want to talk, laugh and donate shekels to Planned Parenthood, which is an institute for murder? You want to do that? Great! These are exactly the people who should be targeted for any sort of legal harassment of this type. As I said in the video Recovering the Freedom of Association back in August 2017, we need to start turning the tables against these people. The misadrists, the anti-white racists, basically the whole left. And use their tools and their laws against them. And use them mercilessly. No compromise, no settlement, no nothing. Purely on principle, take them to the cleaners until they come and beg for a renegotiation. Then, and only then, should we engage in discussing terms like, okay, you can have your ladies' nights, but gentlemen's clubs are back on the table, no questions asked, otherwise no deal. The left understands one thing and one thing only, and that is power. And power on, these kinds of, uh, on this kind of topic is something we have been lacking on the right for quite some time. So we first need to incrementally rebuild that power. One lawsuit at a time, one Me Too at a time, and one Mike Pence rule at a time, until we have enough power to dominate the topic. And that time isn't far, as far away as uh, people think it is. The mood is already changing. Three years ago, such a case would have been derided with 90% of the comments accusing the plaintiff of being thin-skinned and all the rest. How do I know? Because three years ago, I was part of the team who provided intellectual guidance to other members of the non-feminist sector who successfully bankrupted several feminist misadrist enterprises. Back then, the average comment in news stories was almost always negative. That's not the case today. In the current year, the proportion is staggeringly different, with about two-thirds of the commentariat arguing that the comedian had it coming and that the lawsuit is totally fair. We're far from winning the argument, mind you, but we're one step closer than we were one year ago. The important uh, aspect right now is to not relent. Keep the pressure on. Keep the left always on the def defensive. Force them to defend their misandry and their anti-white and anti-European hatred on the public record. Force them to be honest. The free market and the laws they themselves helped put in place will do the rest. All right, and finally, last news from uh, this episode, also from the judicial activism front, coming from the New York Times, a former newspaper. He took on the Voting Rights Act and won. Now he's taking on Harvard. Now, the article is very long, and I do suggest you read it in its entirety, but I'll read here only some uh, excerpts. Quote, 
A former mayor in Poway, a small city in Southern California, wrote a column in August in his local newspaper with this headline, A Gun to My Head. He was upset, uh, upset about how a state law had forced Poway to redo its voting districts so Latinos would have a better chance of winning elections. Read the piece, uh, reading the piece on his computer 3,000 miles away, Edward Bloom knew he had found his newest case. Seeing uh, on one of uh, his bête noire racial gerrymandering at work, Mr. Bloom recruited the former mayor, Don Higginson, as a plaintiff and on October the 4th filed a federal lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the California Voting Rights Act. Mr. Bloom is not a lawyer, but he is a one-man legal factory with a growing record of finding plaintiffs who match his causes, winning big victories and trying, above all, to erase racial preferences from American life. Mr. Bloom, 65, has orchestrated more than two dozen lawsuits challenging affirmative action practices and voting rights laws across the country. He is behind two of the biggest such cases to reach the Supreme Court, one attacking consideration of race in admissions at the University of Texas, which he lost, the other contesting parts of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, widely considered one of this country's most important pieces of civil rights legislation, which he won. Now, in his most high-profile cause of the moment, he has asserted that Harvard University's affirmative action policies amount to an illegal quota system that denies high-achieving Asian-American students admission in numbers commensurate with their qualifications. He has already forced Harvard to turn over, under court seal, years of highly sensitive data about demographics, test scores, and even some personal essays, and he now has a powerful ally in the Justice Department, which is looking into a similar complaint. Mr. Bloom said he was acting on pure principle, that people should never be judged by the color of their skin. Most Americans don't want race to be part of our, uh, your application to college, he said. They don't want the police to use race as a profiling tool to prevent crime. They don't want prosecutors to use race in the makeup of a jury. Your race and your ethnicity should not be something used to help you or harm you in your life's endeavors. How a financial advisor without a law degree has managed to bring so many cases that make, as he called it, big law, is a testament of his methods. He is a mat matchmaker bringing together two forces, students and others who believe they are being mistreated in the name of racial justice, and conservative donors who finance his work and that of the high-powered establishment Republican lawyers who take the cases to court. In the current environment, Mr. Bloom has been called many things, including a courageous man of the moment willing to take on the entrenched, politically correct policies and the tool of rich conservatives trying to extinguish efforts to help historically oppressed minorities overcome the long shadow of racism. Yes, Björk. In most of his cases, Mr. Bloom either sues under the name of his own organizations or he recruits plaintiffs to uh, challenge racial policies he thinks are unfair. Although he claims to have 22,000 members in his group, students uh, for fair admissions, the plaintiff in the lawsuits, uh, in lawsuits against Harvard and other colleges, Harvard says in uh, uh, court papers that he's a go Godfrey uh, whose uh, organization is nothing but his alter ego. Rachel Kleinman, a senior counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, said that Mr. Bloom's opposition to affirmative action was related to this fear of white people that their privilege is being taken away from them and given to somebody else who they see as less deserving. Pointing to his own upbringing and the anti-Semitism his family experienced in the South in the 1950s and 60s when his father was a traveling salesman and some hotels did not accept Jewish guests, Mr. Bloom said such criticism missed the mark. He, called the, he recalled living in Orlando, uh, Florida, I think, when his family's synagogue received a bomb threat and uh, the congregation asked a neighboring church to join in, forming a citizen patrol. The church refused until Mr. Bloom said his father called a bomb threat to the church. I seem to come from a line of uh, compulsive people who believe in certain things and just don't let them go uh, easily, he said, smiling. His first lawsuit was a product of personal experience. Mr. Bloom ran for Congress in Houston as a Republican in 1992 and lost. What bothered him most, he said, was the district's tortured shape design to make it easier for a minority candidate to win the seat. He filed the case claiming racial gerrymandering and uh, nursed it to the Supreme Court, which ruled in his favor in 1996. He began to file similar suits in other states. Bravo! <laughs> I really love this guy already. <laughs>
See? It is these kinds of people that we need more of, not less. Read the comments on that article from the Pravda on Hudson as well. The comments are absolutely hilarious. I mean, yeah, sure, uh, casual basic bitches, otherwise known as New York liberals, are bending over backwards to defend Harvard's racist policies and the previously anti-white voting system. And they're failing on their own ideology. Again, Mr. Bloom is doing exactly what needs to be done. Turn their laws against them and make the far left live up to its own book of rules. Because nobody can live up to his own book of rules. And his strategy should be replicated. Now, sure, he is a, uh, in a slightly different context. Um, he lives in the most litigious society that ever existed. But while the methods will differ a little bit, his tactics and his mentality should be the baseline for anyone who wants to do this in other countries. For instance, in continental Europe, you don't sue about most of these stuff, including racial or ethnic discrimination, but you can flood the local discrimination ombudsman, or whatever it's called, with complaints. Remember, if the rule says that every letter is answered, send 30,000 letters. The point is to have every single leftist on notice. Make them doubt their actions. Don't let them sleep. Make it appear to them that the next expensive litigation may be just around the corner. <laughs> anyway, it is really great that Mr. Bloom exists. I hope he lives a long and fruitful life with as much winning as possible in court, for he is doing God's work on this topic. Again, I applaud his tactics, not necessarily his motives. Leftists suspect he is a racist, but leftists always project. There is no racist like a leftist racist. I actually think the guy is honest since he's been doing this decades before he found big don donors for his cause. So he legitimately believes in non-discrimination. As you know, I don't. I believe in freedom of association, and as a result I regard Mr. Bloom's cause as a means to an end and not an end in itself. As long as we keep our eyes on the trophy, we should be uh, very content with uh, supporting such characters. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it for this episode. Uh, a lot of other good stuff have happened as well, uh, but I chose only the big ones <clears throat> that have deep implications uh, on long-term policy, simply because our goal has to be shifting the policy, because otherwise, what's the point of political activism? And we need to get acquainted again to looking at the longer-term game, not just one election cycle. We used to be very good at this, but then I guess something happened in early 90s and the right has become obsessed with fighting from one election cycle to the other whilst abandoning long game. That will have to change. And it is slowly changing, one good news at a time. We just need to maintain our joyfulness while we fight because if we don't, then we become the mean, bitter soy boys that the left is populated with. And that would be terrible. Also, we need patience. Where I'm coming from, we say patience and tobacco, because it does take patience to change things around. Rome wasn't built in a day either. And with all of that being said, thank you all for watching. Thank you for your continuous and generous support. If you derive any value from the work we do here and you can afford it, please do consider throwing a shekel. It really helps keep this going. Please do subscribe to my social media and... Um, I'll see you all soon on Freedom Alternative.